authority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. You probably already know this by now, but New York lifted its mask mandate this week for most public indoor spaces, and it looks like for now at least the Omicron wave of the virus is winding down. That's according to Governor Kathy Hochul. But not everyone's happy with how things are shaping out. Some wanted to keep the rule, at least until the numbers get a little bit lower. But others say Hochul didn't go far enough. For now, she's keeping masks in schools, which has critics upset and confused about why the one mandate was lifted while the other was not. Hochul didn't say what metrics she's using for these decisions, but said if numbers stay low, her position could change next month. That is a very strong possibility, um, but I am not, I will factor all the data that's gathered during that week, look at everything else I've mentioned, as well as global trends, global trends. And I also want to make sure that our guidance is very thoughtful on what could possibly re-trigger the institution of this again, hopefully never again, but we have to be realistic. Masks will also stay in a few other places like mass transit and healthcare facilities. More on that on our website. That's at nynow.org. In the meantime, a controversy from the Cuomo administration is now bleeding into the Hochul administration. Daryl Camp is here with more. Daryl. That is correct. The former Cuomo administration was no stranger to controversy during the pandemic, but it looks like some of that will bleed over into the Hochul administration as well. Republicans in the state legislature are calling on Hochul's new health commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, to launch a review of the agency's decisions throughout the pandemic. Among them was a controversial directive that required nursing homes in New York to accept COVID positive patients as long as they could separate them from others. That was in effect for less than two months during the height of the pandemic in 2020. But critics have argued the directive helped to spread the virus in nursing homes. Former Health Commissioner Dr. Howard Zucker said at the time that it was staff that spread the virus in those facilities and not COVID positive patients. So Republicans are saying now that they would like a second look at that directive and the impact that it might have had. Senator Sue Serino is a Republican from the Hudson Valley. You know, whenever there's a tragedy, airplane crash, whatever it is, there's a deep dive into an investigation. And that has not happened here. And that's what these families want. Commissioner Bassett was asked if she would support that kind of investigation this week during a virtual state budget hearing, and she said she was focused on what's happening right now in nursing homes and does not want to rehash decisions that were made when she wasn't there. It's still critically important to me to make sure that residents of nursing homes remain safe during Omicron, and I've, we've been doing that at the health department. This is not the first time this issue has come up. In a report last January, investigators with the state AG's office said the directive may have added to the spread of virus in nursing homes, but they didn't say anything definitive. And going back now could be difficult given how much has changed since that time. Albany Area Assemblyman John McDonald. Well, I, I think the challenge that Dr. Bassett is facing, to be honest with you, is to go back and recreate the scene of the accident when you were even there is very difficult. And a lot of people that were involved are no longer there. The people who are responsible, who had most of the information, are no longer available. It is possible that Commissioner Bassett could change her mind and launch a new investigation, but so far, there does not seem to be an appetite there from the Hochul administration. All right, something to keep an eye on. Thank you, Daryl. So also this week, mayors from around New York made their case to the state legislature for more funding in this year's state budget. This happens every year as part of the budget process. And this year was a little different. For one, because it was all virtual. But for two, new New York City Mayor Eric Adams made his first appearance before the legislature since taking office. He wants more funding from the state in a few critical areas, but he's also asking for changes to the state's criminal justice laws. Among them would be stronger penalties for 16 and 17 year olds caught with a gun if they won't say where the gun came from. Adams says those kids are being used by adults because under current law, they'll get lighter sentences in family court. These children are being exploited by adults to carry guns. And when you allow them to go to family court and they're adjudicated in family court, 
then you are going to constantly have these young people being exploited. We'll get more into that later in the show. In the meantime, let's look now outside the five boroughs. When you look at federal data, there is a big difference between New York City and the rest of the state, and that's population growth. Now, there is some good news here. Most of the state's cities grew over the last decade. But according to the state controller's office, the population of New York City grew at nearly four times the rate of the state's other smaller cities on average. And the perennial question is, how can we make these smaller cities in New York into places where people want to move or even just stay? For more on that, I turned this week to Senator Jeremy Cooney, who chairs the Senate's Cities 2 Committee. Senator Cooney, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Glad to be here, Dan. So you're kind of an expert on New York's small and mid-sized cities. You did a tour in the fall called the Regenerate Tour. We've talked about it before. You're chair of the Cities 2 Committee. We're talking about the state budget. From your perspective, what needs to be in this year's state budget for those small and mid-sized cities in New York? What needs to be in there to really boost them up? Well, first, let me say I'm an upstate guy. I, I was raised in Rochester. And so uh, this past fall, I did that uh, five city tour, which became an eight city tour, which became an 11 city tour. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time uh, traveling across upstate New York talking about what their needs are. Um, this budget, I think, goes a step in the right direction uh, for what our upstate, our small and mid-sized cities are, are looking for. We recognize that there are cities other than the great city of New York that if you invest a little bit of, of resource and time and attention to, can become great population centers for our state. So whether it's downtown revitalization, whether it's investing in childcare, whether it's talking about neighborhood blight, whether it's talking about economic development, how we attract new jobs to, to cities across the state of New York. These are all ways that we can invest in these small and mid-sized cities. Is it just about that funding in terms of, is it just about pushing funding to these cities? Or do you see an avenue where tax breaks or tax incentives could help people and businesses in these cities? You often hear from the other side of the aisle that Democrats like to tax and spend. So they like to argue, well, why don't we lower taxes and offer more incentives for business and towards the economy? Where do you see that? Do you think we need more of that? I absolutely do. I think that we have seen since the elimination of the salt tax, uh, a lot of New Yorkers talking about the impact that taxes have on their ability to stay in our state. That said, I also saw a governor who prioritized taxes and recognized that uh, middle class property tax uh, payers need a break. And so she proposed an acceleration of a middle class uh, tax rate cut in her budget. Uh, she also talked about a property tax uh, voucher in her in her budget. So she recognizes those same issues that we're hearing in cities across upstate New York. But listen, it's tax dollars when invested wisely that can make all the difference in creating these vibrant city centers that will really change the shape of New York. There's no reason that New York State has to be just about New York City. It can be about Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse and Albany and Yonkers and, and everywhere in between. Uh, these are the places where we had great success stories in the past, whether it's in my hometown of Rochester with the launch of uh, Eastman Kodak Company or whether it's in, in Buffalo right now with all the rage around the Buffalo Bills. So there's opportunities with tax dollars to be invested into city centers, school programming, uh, making sure that our infrastructure is top notch. If we can do all those things, we can change what New York State looks like, not just for our generation, but future generations to come. I'm always looking for the key of what's gonna bring people back to these upstate cities and full disclosure. So I vacation to Austin, Texas quite a bit. I really love it there. And I'm always thinking, how can we bring those ideas of Austin, Texas up to a place like Albany, New York to make it a place where young people would like to relocate and would like to lead their lives and live out the rest of their lives. What do you think the key to that is? Is it just about offering those incentives like, like structuring up the, the government centers and, and providing new incentives for people or is it is it about attracting these businesses? I'm always looking to see what's going to get these young people here. The winning formula is a high quality of life with a good paying job. If upstate cities are able to tell recent college graduates or graduates who have uh, gone to the University of Rochester and then gone off to Northern California to work in the tech sector, if we're able to tell those recent college graduates, come back, come back to upstate New York. 
because you can buy a house. You can have a very short commute. You can access the beautiful Adirondack State Park. Uh, we don't have forest fires and mudslides and earthquakes. <laughs> you can come to a place like upstate New York, but we're also going to have a job for you to get. And I think this pandemic, if it's taught us anything, it's taught us the power of remote working. Citizens can choose to move wherever their feet will take them and wherever their laptop can get plugged into. So we have to be intentional about investing in cities like the upstate New York cities I visited on this tour. Because if we do that, people will be intentional about not just visiting the big cities that we hear about on television, like Austin, Texas, and others, <laughs> but exploring our own backyard. And it's cities like Rochester, which have a wonderful arts and cultural scene. So I think it's, again, quality of life, but you have to have good paying jobs. And that's what the state of New York can work on doing. Absolutely. So you mentioned the governor's uh, proposal for a property tax rebate when we first started speaking. I'm wondering if you think that goes far enough to lowering the state's property taxes. As you and I both know, for people who want to buy a home in upstate New York, that's often a critical barrier in some counties that have higher property taxes than others. And often those higher property taxes come in counties with large urban centers. So do you think that the, the state needs to go further and do something beyond the rebate to try to lower these property tax bills? Well, certainly it's a step in the right direction. And I also think it sends a very important message that we recognize that this can be a burden on working class families. But I think it'll also take all of us in the state legislature working with our partners at the federal level to make sure that all of the advantages that state and local taxes on in terms of our federal tax deductions can be made. I think that's a critically important factor that we can't just uh, brush off after a campaign season. This is something that is going to continue to weigh on the minds of New Yorkers for years to come. But again, I go back to how are those tax dollars spent? Where are those resources going? If we may have a higher tax uh, capability of our state than, than other states, but if we have great quality schools, if we have roads that don't have potholes all the way through them, uh, if we have wonderful state parks to visit in the middle of a pandemic, well, then maybe folks are willing to pay for that. And I bet you a dollar for donuts that most of upstaters agree that that is a price worth paying if it means that they can raise their family with a, sa with a safe quality of life that you can't find in other parts of our great country. All right, Senator Jeremy Cooney, a bright future ahead, it sounds like, Chair of Cities too. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So we'll look out for more from Senator Cooney on all of that. In the meantime, let's continue the conversation on upstate New York. If you live upstate, you know that investment in these cities is really just one part of the equation. There's also a lot of really unique challenges facing upstate communities right now, like a huge cost coming for businesses over unemployment during the pandemic. For that and more, I spoke this week with Justin Wilcox from Upstate United, an advocacy coalition based upstate. Justin, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Of course, anytime. So we are in the middle of state budget season. The governor has proposed her state budget. The legislature is now working on their own proposals for the state budget. You represent Upstate United. I want to know from your perspective, what does Upstate really need in this budget? It's an area of the state, big area of the state, that's often been ignored by lawmakers in a really big way in terms of investment. So what do we really need in this spending plan? Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you for, uh, for that introduction. And, and I will tell you, we having Governor Hochul, who's from Upstate, uh, who understands the needs of Upstate, is is incredible, right? What I saw in the governor's budget was, uh, you know, someone that actually understood that we need things like the Brownfield Cleanup Program uh, extended because that's incredibly beneficial to Upstate New York. It doesn't only uh, put, you know, property tax uh, properties back on the tax rolls and create more vibrant communities creates healthier communities, right? We're remo removing toxins from the communities. Um, and at the same time, we're creating economic activity. So it's a win-win. Love the fact that it's in there. Um, unfortunately, there's a new application fee, a $50,000 application fee. Would like to see that removed. That, uh, that's a little bit of the old Albany. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more of the new Albany with, uh, with Governor Hochul and acknowledgement that uh, you know, we do need to extend the program, but removal of the application fee, uh, or at least lowering it significantly, 
would be uh, you know, much more beneficial. You know, we're talking about the exodus a little bit here from upstate New York. Uh, you know, as you said, 300,000 people moving out of the state. It's been a trend that's going on in the state for quite a few years now. We've uh, been a level or we've been declining. So, you know, from your perspective, you're embedded in this. You have your finger on the pulse of the people of upstate New York. What do we need to do to keep people here? What do we need to do to attract people to upstate New York as a destination for, for people to move and start their careers and their families and just live here or just stay here? It's a great question, Dan. And one of the things that we look at is the tax environment, right? And unfortunately, New York State consistently ranks, you know, the second worst for business tax climate in the nation. If you interview CEOs, they also say it's one of the worst states to do business in. Um, so unfortunately, you're not going to get a lot of uh, site locators and businesses wanting to move to upstate with such a uh, you know burdensome tax environment and high cost of living, right? So we're chasing New Yorkers with our policies out of the state, um, and they're going to places like like Florida. I mean, what does that say about New York when you actually have New Yorkers more willing to contend with alligators and hurricanes than they are um, the tax climate and the high cost of living in New York. So what can we do about that in terms of, of the budget this year? The governor has proposed, uh, for property taxes at least, she's proposed a rebate program. She wants to speed up income tax cuts for middle income earners, which you know makes a little bit of a dent for people, but I don't think yeah. the drop is really significant enough to, to keep people in upstate New York. So is it is it just those business taxes? How do we get right at that problem? Yeah, no, you're right. It, well, and again, applaud the governor for going in the right direction. You know, it's better than a poke in the eye, right? It, it, having the, uh, the, have it or the the governor speed up the middle class uh, income tax, um, you know, deduction and rebate um, is significant. Uh, but, you know, it's more to your point, it's largely symbolic when you take a look at the years and the structural problems that we have in New York State, the high cost of living, the high taxes. So, you know, we, again, we talked a little bit about the Brownfield cleanup program. Well, another thing that the governor certainly could do, and we'd like to see our leaders in Albany do this, is do something about the unemployment insurance um, rates that are going to go through the roof. We, we're looking at potentially $9 billion of additional taxes that uh, employers are going to have to contend with because of COVID, right? Because of the fact that we had to borrow a significant amount of money from the federal government and that's got to get paid back. You know, any anything we could do to assist our businesses uh, with, uh, you know, uh, some some alleviation of that uh, additional burden that's going to be placed on them, uh, again, through no fault of their own. What happens if, if that money is not, if the state doesn't come up with that money to pay that back in, in terms of, I know it's obviously going to vary by the size of the business, but what kind of burden does that put on a business if the state doesn't do that? Look, some businesses are going to be, incre you know, facing incredible increases. I mean, we're talking well over 100% increase. Wow. Uh, that you're talking tens of thousands of dollars for some businesses. That's just related to the pandemic, though. Unfortunately, that's right. That's not what we've been talking about. A little bit of the structural issues that we've been facing for the past couple decades. Um, so, you know, that's great. But I think again. We need to do more uh, when it comes to alleviating those high taxes that make us one of the worst in the nation uh, and, and the cost of living. So anything we could do in that regard so that we can bring no, more New Yorkers back, cutting taxes, uh, that's something we'll certainly continue to applaud. All right, well, we will see where it all heads this year. It's gonna be a very exciting budget season. Justin Wilcox from Upstate United, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, if you have thoughts on all of that, we'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email at nynow at wmht.org. But turning back now to New York City, Bernadette Hogan from the New York Post joins me now in studio. Bern, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So it was a big day. Eric Adams first facing the legislature for the first time since taking office. He's going to do it a couple more times, I'm sure. So he wants primarily criminal justice changes. We talked a little bit about Raise the Age earlier in the show, but what does he want with bail reform? It's a little confusing, and I tweeted this out earlier in the week, but this is confusing because nobody's really saying what they specifically want with bail reform. They're kind of just like, 
change it, give judges more discretion, but they don't want to get more into the weeds about that. So what does he say? Right, exactly. And when you're trying to convince a body of 63, um, well, I guess 40, 42, 43? 43. 43 Democrats in the state Senate and then over 100 Democrats in the Assembly who already have had to amend bill reform twice, mm -hmm. or I guess pass it once, amend it once, um, so two times, third time might be the charm. But it's just difficult for him to say, let's fix this without him presenting a plan. Yes. And when I say he's not presenting a plan, like I was on the phone with lawmakers yesterday who were saying, well, he's coming out in the public forum saying, we need to give judges more discretion, um, meaning we need judges. And, and he's, he's saying that, but not explaining how or, oh, he is explaining the why, but on the how. Because with bail reform, they they took away this omnibus blanket discretion that judges had right. and added in several crimes that would be bailable offenses, but then the rest were not, right? right? And then also a judge could decide, okay, bail, remand, whatever's the least restrictive. That's the key word, the least restrictive means. The least restrictive means. And that technically is the discretion that judges do have, but there is a limit because if bail or remand is, w which one is, is the less, right. lesser, yeah, which one is least restrictive? So Adams has not said specifically, here's, here's, uh, here's a list of crimes that I think should go on that list that are bail eligible, or I think judges should be able to exercise discretion when it comes to this dangerousness standard, which is another thing, um, a judge's ability to say whether or not a defendant can go back out into society and be a harm to himself, herself, or others. And so, and that's also, how do you define a dangerousness? I and think, that was a big issue. Yeah, in that's exactly it. I think that if he is going to get anything out of this, I think he needs to come up with a detailed plan of saying, we need to give judges discretion on X, Y, and Z, as in like, uh, you know, criminal history, if they've committed uh, two or three felonies in the past, like if they've been charged with two or three mm -hmm. felonies in the last six months, then judges have more discretion. I think him going out and saying, give judges more power, right. puts him with the Republicans. And obviously they haven't made much progress with Democrats over the last two years. Right, and it gives the Democratic leaders fodder to say, listen, the whole reason we changed this was because there was a fundamental problem with the system. There, it wasn't fair that um, this person from this community was going to be held um, was, was going to remain in jail because they couldn't post bail, but then that person could get out for the same crime because they could. Mm -hmm. And that's not really what Adams is talking about. He's not disagreeing with the fundamental reason why they changed it. He's just saying, listen, like, they, this clearly has been problematic. Judges have said it. DAs have said it. And how can we fix this? But again, he's he has not started to call lawmakers, or at least overwhelming, like, you, you've got to be able to convince, build a relationship, build a relationship. But, but you know, he was a state senator, so he yeah. knows what needs to be done. But Andre Stewart Cousins, earlier this week, she said, you know, I really haven't talked to him. He hasn't presented a plan to me to change this. But he's coming up to Albany on Monday, and he's expected to meet with both the Democratic majorities in the Senate and the Assembly, and I'm sure that will come up extensively. But he, he said to lawmakers during the hearing this week, I'm going to present my own analysis. I'm going to show you. And, you know, he's he also d is able to say, listen, look at what's going on in the city with crime and shootings. This is a problem. And again, I've talked to judges, I've talked to DAs, and they want some sort of tweaks. They don't want a full overhaul, but they want some sort of massaging of what's going on. But again, he's litigating this in a public forum and not not as much as we can see right now behind closed doors and on the negotiation table. Right. He really needs bill language. And the thing is, with mayors, they can hit or miss on some issues. Right. I mean, with Bill de Blasio, he certainly made some inroads a lot of the time with a universal pre-K in New York City. That was a big accomplishment for him. And mm -hmm. part of why he could do it was because he formed those relationships with lawmakers for funding and opportunities. Right. right. Yeah. To his credit, he really went to the individual members and said, listen, like, what do you want? Here's what I want. Where can we get? and was able to make that happen. But then in other instances, you know, he you just say he wanted something. But like, again, it's so difficult with, uh, New York City is a locality at the right. end of the day. So that's why Adams even came up to lobby lawmakers on what he wants and just hear from lawmakers on what they want from him. And, you know, it, it really is paying the respects. One lawmaker said to me yesterday, they go, yeah, Adams has to come up and pay his respects. 
So <laughs> that's another element too. It's like, you know, you gotta make, you gotta pick up the phone and call and say what you want and you know, have a conversation. And, and I'm excited to see him come here in person because I, I mean, this is gonna be the, probably the biggest in-person thing that's happening in the Capitol in at least a year. So to see him walking around the halls, I'm really interested to see how he interacts with people, what, how the whole Democratic conference mm -hmm. thinks of him. Because as you know, some members are really going hard against him over the bail reform stuff. So we'll see, we are out of time, unfortunately. Bern Hogan from the New York Post, thank you so much as always. And we will see you back here next week. Until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.